Everybody's got a story, you just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen. And today, actor, writer, and comedian Jamie Adursky joins me on the podcast. Now, Jamie's life is full of all sorts of twists and turns. She dreamed of being an actress, but she somehow found her way to become a TikTok star. Her story is full of just inspiration and fun and humor and just a great way to live your life. So let's get to it. Jamie Adursky, welcome to Good Listen. How are you? Thank you. I'm I'm great. Well, I'm glad you're great. And uh, I want to talk about this amazing transition that you, you've, you've un- undergone because you started as a young, bright, vibrant comedian, actress in New York City. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're married and have kids and like your entire perspective on the world has changed, right? Because as a comedian, you, it's like truth and comedy as you know, we've all done the UCB classes and trying to find the truth. And so your truth as a young person was probably like your life, what was going on. And then all of a sudden, like this huge life shift happens. And then essentially your comedic perspective shifts. So let's start with the original. When you first saw yourself being an actress, comedian, writer, what were you envisioning? What were your goals? Because I always like to say like as a kid, my dream was to be the next David Letterman. It didn't turn out that way, but I ended up having a pretty decent career anyway. But like as a kid, did you grow up envisioning yourself as a certain actress, creator? What was your perspective at that time? Definitely. So when I was little, uh, my mom said, I used to say, I want to be in Marshalls. <laughs> so I thought that was this, yeah, the road paved with gold was commercials. Um, but I, I was always in the performing arts my whole life. Um I always knew I wanted to be an actor, a singer. When I was younger, I did a lot of dance um, and I did a lot of singing. I was really into Broadway and I thought that I was going to be on Broadway. That was my my dream. Um, That did not quite happen. But, you know, other things, uh, same as you, other great things happened. Um, So, yeah, so that's originally was originally my plan. I went to school to be a musical theater uh, major, Wagner College, and then I ended up dropping out after six months. I was going to go to a program called Point Park that had more of a dance, uh, a stronger dance program, and I was an excellent dancer. I thought, hey, this is going to be my way onto onto Broadway. I'm a really good singer. I am not the best singer, but I'm an awesome performer and an awesome dancer, so let me really focus on that. And then I ended up over Christmas break, I booked an equity musical. Um, so I ended up doing that. And then I just kept booking work. So I didn't go back to college. Uh, then I ended up getting a record deal. Wow. Which is kind of uh, was interesting. Um, we, we had a development deal on Epic Records. And that was a whole, I could do a whole podcast of, <laughs> about <laughs> that experience because that was wild. Um, This was, you know, right after Britney Spears broke and it was very much girl band, boy band. And you're literally a kid, right? You're in your teens at this point. Um, I when when I started with the group, I was 19. Okay. um, I was 19 or 20. And, you know, we were together for like two years and then a year or two we were recording. We were playing out at different venues in the city. Um meeting different record labels, and then we got this development deal from Epic. What was the name of the and band? You got to share the name of the band, in case there's any fan, old fans out there. Yeah. <laughs> we were the Velvet Girls. Okay. So it was, uh, it was was it was wild. We had um, like a kiss kind of theme, so I was the cat, and I had like crazy cat makeup, and um, then we had another girl. She was like star, like star man, kind of oh, like- wow that vibe who is that singer why can't i think of the uh, name paul stanley yes yes exactly um and then we had uh more of like a, a like a space vibe not quite the star but like a space crazy vibe i don't like the tongue guy who's the tongue guy the like tongue that was her. Simmons. yep yes okay. thank you okay um yeah so it was crazy we played stone pony we played with uh funkadelic we like I, I, all kinds of anyway let's not take up the whole time wow, with that's that. awesome that's great though like i was never i think most people watch this were never in a girl or boy <laughs> band so that's really cool so please don't don't just like shuffle that off like that's really cool um so but it sounds like you said you were together for a couple of years 
I guess yeah. there was no golden ring at the end uh, at the we end of that journey. Off. So <laughs> yeah, like we recorded a few songs. I met some really cool people, had amazing exper- experiences. We got dropped. Then I got picked up again for a deal on DreamWorks Records as a, a duo with a, a DJ. And they ended up not going with me. I was 23. They said I was too old. Oh. So like I did the music video and all this stuff. And then in the end, I didn't get it. But um, then I moved to New York and I went to acting school, started taking that very seriously. I uh, got an agent for commercials. I did some modeling. I did uh, a lot of really cool things as well, acting and modeling and, and meeting people and waitressing. And uh, I met my husband. Um, yeah. And then I got comedy. So, yeah. So let's talk about that. Well, let's, before you get to the comedy pivot, let's talk about the acting pivot. So, because I think people always have this where they want to follow their dreams, but then they have this realization, it, this ain't happening for me. Yeah. And you were still pretty young. Like, I, I think we yeah. can all say that if you're in your twenties, you're still an emotional wreck. I mean, we're an emotional wreck in middle age too, but like even worse yeah. in your twenties, cause you're trying to quote unquote, find yourself. Yeah. So what was that moment like? I don't know if it was like an, one moment or a series of moments where you're like, oh shit, I guess, I guess I'm not going to be the singer I thought I was going to be. Yeah. So that second time when I, re- you know, like I had people pumping me up, telling me I was going to be the next Madonna. I was going to be the next Britney. And it was amazing and terrifying. And, um, you know, when we got dropped from the initial label, it was like, okay, I, I knew a lot. I, I met a lot of people in the industry. And then when I got picked up by this production company working with DreamWorks, I like, um, was like, okay, this is it. And we worked with, um, Someone from Luscious Jackson. I can't remember anyone's name. It was so long ago. Jill Cuniff. So she was part of it too. So I would like sing vocals with her. And um, it was just really cool. And then when that fell through, like I was pretty devastated. But I also was really young and I knew what I had. Like I, you, you know. You still had confidence in your ability. You weren't. Yeah. You didn't think like, oh God, am I a hack or anything like that. No, I, I, I wasn't. It really wasn't that at all. I think. You know, it's much harder as you get older to recover from these things in certain ways, but also easier because you care less about what people think, you know? Right. So um, it was easy in a lot of ways because then I just picked up and I moved to New York and, you know, I started on all those amazing adventures you have in your 20s in New York City. And um, yeah, I went to I went to an acting conservatory for two years and um, really got serious about about acting. Um and then that was a whole other thing because I realized, hey, I I forgot that I'm really funny. And like I was always like the funny person in high school. And I, like I was voted like most likely to, likely to be famous and class performer. But people that really knew me knew that I was funny. But also, you know, I grew up in a time when it was like, well, women aren't funny. Like women should just be pretty. And that was very much um, like I don't come from a performing family background I come from a very blue collar background and it was you know kind of like just make the most of what you have and you're cute so that's what you should do um like use that be a weather girl you know it which is very depressing thinking about that now I would never say that to my daughter but um yeah it's you know like that's kind of the world that I grew up in like I didn't have a lot of like people that I saw that were doing what I was doing so it was just kind of like hustling as much as I could to make the most of anything that I had and what I wanted to do, which was perform and do, you know, creative things. Um, So, yeah. So I would say, you know, going down the acting route, which is also, of course, heartbreaking in many ways, I got to the point where I was in, you know, like I, I had some big agents that were really interested in me. And in the end, it would come down to, well, you you're not going to book these funny roles. Like you need to be sexier. You need to, uh, uh, an acting teacher li- literally told me I need to use my lips more on camera when I speak. So this was someone that a really big agent, a huge agent, she was really interested in me to sign me. And she sent me to this acting teacher, very popular acting teacher in New York. And that was her note to me. You're not going to book these funny parts. Stop trying to be funny. Although you are funny, but um that for me that was the end that was the beginning of the end for me like trying to really pursue an acting career and I think that was probably the most heartbreaking of like all the things I had experienced because I finally felt like 
I was being myself and like really, you know, at this point I was like early 30s or like late 20s, early 30s. And I was like, I finally got it. Like I, I know who I am. I've studied, you know, like I have the background. It's all coming together. I'm funny. Like this is what I do. And then for someone who you admire so much, you know, to say, no, like you're not going to pick that, you know. So it was just kind of, again, like I had to really rethink. Like I feel like a theme of my life has been like pivoting, just constantly yeah. pivoting and being okay with that. And, you know, it is that that struggle. It's like that down and then you're up and then you're down and then you're up. So that's when I found the People's Improv Theater, which is where I met you. Yeah, the pit. And all right, but before we go, there, I need to ask. Yeah. What yeah. does it mean to move, m use your lips more? What does that mean? Joe, I'm still trying to figure it out. I know. <laughs> like, I literally, like, it was an on-camera class. And I'm, like, sitting there. And, and, like, she said this in front of everybody. She also told me I needed to lose weight. And I was a size four. Oh, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. was the other thing. I was constantly getting that, like, you need to, again, size four, beautiful, t you know, 20s, early 30s. Oh, you know, looked way younger than I, than I was. And still, it was never enough. Like, no one was really listening or watching what I was doing. It was like, no, you need to be sexy. Talk with your, talk with your lips more. I'm like, I don't want to do that. That is crazy. Yeah. Like, that is like, a, you. Um, and this is not that long ago. I know we all feel, you and I, Jamie, probably feel like we're ancient, but like that was not that long ago. Like that's a story you would hear from like 1950s Hollywood, yeah. like on the set of MGM somewhere. Like it's yeah. crazy that that was still going on in the, you know, in the 2000s. It's bizarro. Um, all right. So you mentioned the People's Improv Theater, uh, uh, famously known as The Pit. Uh, I performed there. You performed much better there than I am. I was, I was essentially a hack. I was just working my way through, but. Uh, last season, I had James the Third on, who's an amazing sketch performer, yes. writer, played I on I love UCB. him. He, and we talked about this weird world of sketch comedy. Uh, yeah. And and for him, it was really. I mean, you, you you talked about the barrier of like, oh, you need to be pretty enough. You you know, women can't be funny. He was this black dude trying to get in sketch comedy with Jamie, as you know. All the people look like us. It's all a bunch of white people who who, who had pretty decent backgrounds who just who thought they could be funny. They want to be on SNL. He yeah. had a tough time doing it. So tell me about your perspective. And you mentioned the fact that women aren't considered quote unquote funny. What mm -hmm. was it like to be in that world where, yeah, women can be funny and, yeah. and women are funny. What, what, did, did that just seem to open up a, like a new world for you because you were in such an accepting place? Yes, I really, I actually like, I get chills thinking about it because it really, you know, I took my first class there and I was like, this is it. This is, and not in a way of like, you know, like that, the stress of like, this is it. I got to have this. Like, like, you know, not like that, but I felt so comfortable and also out of my comfort zone at the same time, because, you know, the way I had trained as an actor, you know, there is that element of being in the moment, but as a person and as an actor, it's something I always struggled with. Like for me, that was always the hardest thing. And I still struggle with is really being in the moment and not anticipating um, and something that improv improv comedy teaches you is that you you have to be in the moment or you're you're done. You can't you can't even you can't function on stage if you're trying to think two steps ahead. So that was so freeing for me, not just as an artist but as a person. And it's something that I still pull from and I still work on. I still think about. Um, and so and that was just so such a special message to get. You know. Um, after all, like the bullshit from people of like, you're not this, you're not that, you're not enough of this. Like, you know, I think one thing that's really special about improv comedy is that it is so accepting and that everyone really does have a, a place there as long as you're a good person. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, there's something really, really magical and special about it. And especially at that time period in New York City, it really was electric, like that improv comedy scene. I don't know that it will ever be that again. I t try to explain it to people. You know, it really, it was just the place to be. I mean, and it w was such a, um, the thing about improv comedy as well, it's very different from stand-up where stand-up is very much more a messy kind of mean in a lot of ways. And I think that's why I, I love doing stand-up, but I'm not as drawn to it because of, the realm of it is not, it's 
kind of mean sometimes. It's, you know, a little more cutthroat in a way that like, let's say acting is and, you know, the things I didn't enjoy about that. Whereas improv, you work as a team, you're an ensemble, um, you know, so as much as you're working on your own craft, you are working in a group and you have to make it work. So that to me, you know, as a human, as an artist, it, that is such an amazing skill to have and to work on. And it just makes you better. Yeah. And we, we were so lucky to be in, you mentioned this sort of golden age of improv. Well, I mean, and it might have been oversaturation, you know, looking back at it now. But if you were in New York in the early mid 2000s, you could go to three theaters that had comedy running seven days a week. And then you also had, uh, Jamie, I'm sure you know, those random offshoots where there was like a basement that you could perform at noon on a Wednesday or something like that. So, so that was, and I think, you know, I think a lot of people at the time were actually were complaining. I remember Bob Odenkirk. Uh, I remember he went to um, that big thing that they, that UCB used to do every year, the uh, Odell Close Festival. Remember they did those, mm -hmm. those, yeah. those, like that big weekend and he performed at one and he talked about how it's just, there's way too much of it. And I think that's probably what kind of undid it at the end that and the pandemic but still the idea that you could be a performer and literally perform every night of the week and even <laughs> during the day was yeah. such an amazing time and and like you said I don't think we'll ever see that again no it's too expensive you know and I was the artistic director one of the artistic directors at the pit for a while and I saw that firsthand that other side of well you need to pay the bills and I think you know that was part of the implosion of it is that it's not it's not sustainable for theaters to put up these teams night after night and not really make money from them. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, and it is an oversaturation too, of course, you know, there was just so much at that point. Um, but I am glad to see that, you know, new theaters are popping up in the city and like second city and UCB is reopening and, um, the pit is still going strong. I was there like a month ago doing a show and it was really fun. Um, th these are so important for, people coming up in, in the comedy world to have access to those. And I hope that they know now how lucky they are because I feel like a lot of people didn't um, before the pandemic realize how, what a, what an honor and a gift it was to have these spaces to play at. I would put on plays with my, um, you know, my, my graduate friends of my acting Meisner acting school, and we would have to pay to, to book these theaters, you know, to get people to come see us. You know, it, you don't have to pay to do a show at the pit. Yeah. Which is amazing. Well, and a lot they also did have the, the odd business model, Jamie. As you know, this was actually well written about. Even the New York Times picked this up that a lot of these theaters didn't pay the performers. Yeah. So that, there was thing. also that issue, which there's yeah. only going to be a certain time where people are like, yes, I'm going to perform for free for all for this, for yeah. this theater to make money. So that was also, again, not the perfect model, but again, no. a great time if you're a performer because if you wanted to perform, you could perform. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yes, of course, there's that a dual issue of not being paid. Absolutely. And, you know, I see all sides of it. Um, I will say that I, I do think, it, you know, not having to pay performers, depending on what the show is, it gives people the, you know, ability to, you know, cut their teeth and, and really get a chance to perform. So I think there is like a threshold for that. Um, but yes, it's all part of why it kind of imploded on itself. And yeah. It's it and all right well let's get into what you actually ended up doing there because you you fell like a lot of us in that world you it's it, the gateway drug was improv uh that's how you kind of started and then all of a sudden you you work into sketch and then obviously in the improv world you develop the 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 important word of character like creating characters in your performance and that was sort of your bag like you created characters i guess starting in your improv days and then you brought that into the sketch world so tell me about developing these characters and how it became such a big part of your comedy career. It was like literally like creating these fresh characters that would perform usually a lot of, I know you did a lot of solo shows, but take us back to that, those days of character development. Yeah. So, you know, my style of improv just ended up being what came naturally to me, which was a lot of character work, um, which again, I discovered through the practice of, of doing improv and, you know, with my acting background and, and my sense of humor, you know, I, I'm such like a, a waiting for Guffman fan. Like I love any kind of humor that, uh, that is like almost not meant to be humor. Like we're really laughing at the person and, you know, it, it feels real, but not real. And so that's what I was drawn to in improv. And then I, that gave me the, 
um, I won't say encouraged, but like it, it inspired me to then write some of these down and start to really work on these characters, which I did. And, and I, you know, performed them live and then, you know, started putting them on tape and, and working with some other people, um, you know, working on characters together. And I feel like, again, that helped me really find my voice, uh, who I am as a performer and a person. I, I really am interested in people. Um, I ended up going back to college and got a degree in psychology. And I thought at one point, maybe I was going to be a psychologist, uh, a really fun, funny psychologist. <laughs> you you um, have to use your lips more, though, I think. Yes. It's very important. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what were some of those characters early on? Because I think uh, and if you can give a little context to this, because people may be like characters. What do you mean? Like like a cartoon character? Like what? Who are these people you were embodying uh, in those yeah. early days? So uh, a comedic you know, version of a, a person, a personification of a person um, as a character. So, you know, think of like a larger than life person, someone that you might see, you know, written as a character on SNL. I had a character I did that was uh, a very difficult child, very um, spoiled in a lot of ways. And uh, his name was Timmy and I loved him. And now I have an eight-year-old son and he's a little bit like <laughs> Timmy. <laughs> In some ways. So that is very funny to me. Well, it makes sense. You created that character and you created your son. So th <laughs> there's something there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I had, I also, um, I created a few, a few of these characters where there were older women, eccentric. I, I, I just love that. I mean, I love the Golden Girls and I love taking that even a step th further and, you know, really living in that space of, you know, what would it be like to be, 75 80 years old and really not given f and just i look forward to that and i like i can't wait for that and so i created a character based on that we did uh, i did it with my friend kayla merrill who's a very funny person as well and we created sharon and cheryl and we would go to different places and you know be ourselves um in these characters and uh it just brought a lot of joy to us and really it seemed like to people around us confusion and joy um, so I did that and, you know, I, several different characters I, I had, you know, written out and I've gotten on tape and, um, yeah, it's cathartic and it's fun and, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, and then at this point, now that you're like, you've found your voice, like, this is like, oh God, this is what I've been working towards my entire life. What do you do with that then? Cause I think people may, may be watching or listening to this right now be like, Okay, so did you make money off of what you were doing? Like, you know, did you make a living off of this? What was, what was going on in the world of Jamie Durst? Yeah. Well, so it's really interesting to look back where I am now and see the chain of events that occurred. So, you know, starting with the characters that really got me writing. And I always loved writing. I always loved creative writing. But I never, again, it's that thing where I was like, I never thought I was good enough to do it. And, you know, writing these characters fueled me to do it more and more and more. And then I got to the point where I wrote a solo show. And um, in the solo show, I, I had some different characters that I had written into the show. But it was also the first time I wrote as my myself, um, but in an elevated way. Uh, so it was really an interesting journey. And I could not have gotten there if I didn't first take that improv class and first start being inspired and like you know like I tend to work really fast when I get excited by something I'm like I gotta get it down I gotta do it and that's how it was with these characters and then that's how it was with the show um and then I had a child and I did another show and um yeah and I just started writing more and more and then people started to hire me to write and that was pretty cool that's awesome uh, you mentioned the child, another pivot in the, in the life of, of Jamie Durski. And I did notice because I remember we've been connected on social media for a while. It you were you were not you were never like the mom person. And then all of a sudden I wake up and then there's truth and momity. Like it's the yeah. it's like now all of a sudden the the swing and single Jamie Durski who is like, you know, <laughs> yeah. performing at two AM at the pit is no longer doing that. Now she's like a fully grown person with with multiple children, a yeah. home. Uh, a happy family life. And then that becomes your comedy. Like that becomes sort of your outlet. So th I guess this kind of gets to the time of you know, speaking of social media, how you, you turned everything that you, all the yeah. talent that you had 
and then your life story and turned it into comedy that people could consume on, on social media. So tell me about that moment. Yeah. So, I mean, I would just, I would start, you know, by saying during the pandemic, I had a really hard time, like a lot of performers and a lot of people, um, we just had, we decided to move out of New York city after having been there for 19 years. And it was just a really hard time. I had had my second baby. She was five or six months at the time. And I was just going through a lot of things and I was about to turn, I just turned 40. Um, so it was a hard couple of years for me, uh, mentally. And then about, I would say like eight months ago, I started like feeling good or even more than that. I started to, I would say like a year ago, I was like, I'm starting to feel more like myself. Like something is, is happening here. Uh, I went back to a dance class and I, and I loved that so much. And then I injured myself again, which I did initially when I was a semi-professional dancer. And that's why I stopped. And then I got really depressed again. And I was like, I thought this was it. I thought I was just going to go to my dance classes, be a mom, be happy, and kind of let go this idea of this comedy career. I had done some stand up in town and um, when we first moved here and like just nothing was really clicking for me. So then you know, I had it in my head, I should start a TikTok. And people had said this to me before. And I was like, I hate social media. I don't want to do t I don't know what to do on TikTok. Like, um, but I like had just had some like work done on my knee. I was on my couch. I really, if you go back and you watch my first TikTok and I will not take it down because I wanted people to see how sad it is <laughs> and how like, you know, anyone can do what I'm doing, but you have to actually do it. So you know, it was January 17th. I made this TikTok and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like I can just like kind of do what I want on here. Being a mom of two kids and, and working as well, it's hard to find time to perform. And, um, you know, people kind of stop asking you after a while and not, not like poor me, but it's also hard to get something together for yourself. And TikTok ended up being this outlet for me that I can just come up with something and do it. And I'm done. And, and, you know, doing content on TikTok, I've, it brings together all of my, my skills as a performer, as far as improvisation, writing, being on camera. Um, so it's just, it's a very interesting tool and not one that I would have considered, you know, a while ago. I would have just said no. So, um, I think what it is, is you really have to be as genuinely yourself as you possibly can. And I think that that, I mean, for me, it's always been kind of a struggle. I don't want to, you know, part of it is being a woman in this business where everyone's always telling you, you know, you're not good enough, this, that, the other. Um, part of it is the world that I grew up in. And, you know, a lot of us grew up in of, you know, like it, it took me a while to find my power and there have been moments in my life where I have found that power. Like, like I said, when I, when I had my record deal, when I started at the pit, when I, you know, those moments have really stood out to me. And then I kind of fell off the cliff and it was like, I can't see anything. I don't see anything. This is dead. Like I just, I'm giving up on all my dreams. That's it. And then I started this thing and it, lit a fire in me I, I I had no plans of it doing anything other than just for me and I once I started this thing I felt so good every morning I would wake up and I would be like I'm just gonna make stupid video who cares like it made me feel good to think of these things and I started to get that spark back and I've been doing it for seven months and I've gone viral a couple times and it's fun it's also crazy the internet is full of crazy people that will tell you crazy things so you have to um be okay with that and by be okay I mean just like delete and block or you know the first time I went viral I got some messages and I was like oh my god I can't do this like <laughs> this person is telling me I'm like you know a piece of garbage like this is hard like I could just I would never I would never do that so it's hard to imagine that people spend their time these trolls which yes I knew existed, but I didn't know really existed until now. Um, so that part can be exhausting. Um, I had a video go viral uh, like a couple weeks ago, and it, um, you know, it's been a lot of that. 
a lot of great things, but a lot of that too. So that can be kind of exhausting. So for me now, it's finding the balance of like, how much time do I want to spend on that? I shouldn't spend any time on trolls, but how much time are right. you willing to give that thing? Because I started this as an outlet for me creatively and that for that it's been successful. But then there is this, also this other element of the more people that see what you do, which is, that's awesome, but it's going to be the more opinions and the more BS that's going to be coming at you. So now I'm trying to find that balance of what am I comfortable with giving um, and what am I getting? So I don't think that's a bad place to be in. I think it's a much better place to be in than I was before I started. So I'll take it. That's so cool. Who says social media is so bad? I mean, it's obviously been great for you and and not just in terms of like career wise, but just like it, it feels like it's sort of like the outside has, uh, has sort of been put inside. Like, oh, oh, so, like I'm performing, having fun, but it's also making me feel great, which is which yeah. is which is what at the end of the day, I think is most people who are performers or people on social media, that's really what you want. Because I, I always joke that I I feel like you have to be a performer, you have to have an ego. Like people say, oh, ego having an ego is bad. But but if you think about it, if you're an actor, you have to be an ego to say, yes, I. I am so good. I need to be projected on a screen that's, you know, five stories tall. Like a normal person doesn't think that. So yeah. I think there is like a healthy ego of like, you've got to want to, you've got to think you deserve to be on that. Whether it's being viewed a million, millions of times like you have on social media or someone who wants to be an actor or on a stage. And I will say this about TikTok because I was late to the TikTok game too as well because me as a Gen Xer, I came up in the social media days of like, everything's got to be perfect. It's got to be the perfect lighting. The shots got to look great. But in a way, TikTok is the brother or sister to improv. Because, Jamie, yeah. as you know, most improv theaters are shit. They are just <laughs> like in the back room of a restaurant. It's yeah. raw. It's gritty. Yeah. And that's really what TikTok is. And and like and like the way you've taken to it is like, you know, there's some videos where you have some uh, higher production values, but most of them, are very simple yeah. and raw. So There's in a no way, the improv production. spirit animal must have come out, right, in that? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's the threshold is low as far as those things. And I think that's what, you know, when I initially uh, completed my acting degree, I, or whatever, program, um, they told one of the teachers was like, you need to get on YouTube and start making videos. I was like, I can't do that. I'm a... A video editor like no and even now that was something exactly like you're saying it held me back because I was like I don't I, you have to be like James Cameron like I can't edit a video and now I'm just like boom 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 but I'm still learning like it's definitely not it's not perfect but yeah it doesn't nothing needs to be perfect I mean I I will go on no makeup just woke up and then a million people will see it and I'll be terrified but that's also not always the case so you're saying you need to have an ego and I think that, you know, I would frame that as you need to believe in yourself no matter what. And I think that that has been like a running theme for me and something that I want my kids to look back and be like, my mom never gave up, um, which is not, it's not easy. You know, it's it's not easy to believe in yourself when you're sitting on your couch and you're like, I haven't done any comedy in I don't know how long. You know, I don't even know anyone in the scene anymore how i'm in new jersey i have two kids i'm i'm 45 how am i going to do anything so i i think you have to believe in yourself and you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable and just taking that leap and again like i don't have a huge follow i have 10k followers i've been doing this seven months i've gone viral a few times it's very cool there's people that are doing doing way more cool shit than me you know and at the same time, I'll have a video that'll get 300 views. So it's not, you can't, you also, you can't put all your eggs in that basket of, oh, I got 2 million views. Like it's now, everything's going to be amazing. No, you still have to like believe in your shit and like try and fail and fail and try. So that's, if you're not willing to do that, then I don't think you can be a creative in general, you know, or, um, because you have to be willing to look stupid and that's the cost of entry for anything, trying something new or, um, you know, being on stage, putting yourself out there. The cost of entry is always looking like a total ass. So um, that's that's part of it. And continuing to look like an ass, but always be a good person. That's, uh, that's <laughs> right here. You always go back to the good person. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's the one thing I, I admire about you, Jamie, is like how comfortable 
and this is uh, you appear to be in your own skin uh because most i would say most people who are in in the entertainment trade would be afraid to say that they're 45 like i and I, and you know, i'm sure you know people like this like who if you look them up online it just says like they're they're the 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 month they were born and the, and the day but not the year because they don't right. want anyone to know how anyone's old because you know one of my running jokes i have in in my real life is like the la the last acceptable ism is ageism. Like yeah. all, all the other, we've done a good job getting rid of the other ones, like sexism and racism. But ageism is one that hangs on. So tell me about that. You being so comfortable in your own skin and be like, "Fuck, I'm 45. It is what it is." Like, yeah, is that something that you that you had to work to get there, or is that something you feel like is part of your brand? I think it's, you know, I think it's both. I think it's more part of who I am. I I think, like I'm. You know, I've certainly had my struggles and my challenges and I continue to like anybody else, but I am proud of the fact that I'm a 45 year old woman who continues to create something and I want to inspire other women to do that as well. I think it's, you know, it's really, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard out there. So, and life is hard. And I think if you can find something that you love to do and do it and, you know, if you can get paid for it even better. But if you can just give yourself that chance, you know, I, I, I never, <laughs> you know, I never want to be like, oh, I'm 45 and I'm so great. I, that's not what I think. But I think that what I do well is not, like I said, not giving up. And I think it's so important for women our age and, and really anyone my age, our age to be like, yeah. hey, like, we, we don't, we still have a voice. We don't need to like go and disappear and you know, ret what retirement's like 65. So we're not even close, but, um, you know, it, it, because there is that feeling of like, oh, well, what, what, who wants me now? Like I'm 45, I have kids. I, you gotta just believe in yourself and it's not as easy as that, but hopefully surround yourself with people that support you. I think that's important too. Like my husband's amazing. My kids are amazing. I have great friends in my life. Um, and I think that's part of why it's important to be a good person too. So you have those things and you can give those things back. That's so cool. Uh, you know, it's funny to talk about the age and the fact that, you know, well, you know, what someone want to do with a 45. I, and I, I, I always like to say, I think the election, uh, seat to cycle when it was Biden and Trump, a lot of it was age was, was a big part of it. And the one thing that was, was odd, I think to most people was that, they're basically the same age, but Trump doesn't play as an 80 year old. I mean, say what you will. I'm not, if yeah. anyone knows me, they know that I, I'm i your typical card carrying liberal from New Jersey. That's yeah. me. But like, you see the way the age plays, the way Biden's age plays as a, opposed to Donald Trump. You cannot take that away from Donald Trump. He does not act like a 80 year old man. I mean, he is, he, He's he can talk for I mean what he says is maybe bullshit but the guy could talk he can to he's say the least grind yeah. for twenty four hours a day Biden and the reason he was sort of forced out was he was playing against his age like he was he was looking like an eighty year old and and I think that's sometimes what people don't really look into they always look at the like the actual number oh this person is forty five they must they're they're too old they must have no energy and then obviously Jamie if anyone knows you watch you on TikTok they know you got plenty of energy you got the energy to spare. From 45. Um, so I think that's why I feel like we the world is missing nuance. Like we're so black and white, we're so data driven that just the nuance of like, oh yeah, but what is that? What is that 80 year old? You know, there's a difference between 80 year olds, there's a difference between people in their 40s. I had a person once, I can't say his name because he would be sued to death, uh, who ran this production company in Los Angeles, very successful. And he said to me at a lunch, just me and him just bullshitting, he goes, I would never hire. I would never hire someone who's over 35. And I said, well, well, why? And at the time I was over 35. So I'm like, what the fuck is this guy talking yeah. about? He goes, <laughs> he goes, from my experience, people who are over 35 are set in their ways and you can't teach them anything. So yeah. again, like it, he seemed it was okay for him to say that, but take out the 35 to be like, oh, um, I would never hire someone who's from Canada. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, that's that's wrong. So again, yeah. it's the nuance of it. Uh, it's it's it is it is important that yeah. we just see beyond what the the paper may say. And it feels exactly. like you're you've grasped that. You 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 get that the, the nuance is very important. 
I, absolutely. I think, you know, saying that someone over 35 is set in their ways. I, I mean, I would say that I, I'm a case for that not being the case. Um, you know, I, I think people that are older are some of the most adaptable people because they have to be. I, if, I, to say that that seems like they're stuck in their ways, I think there's more of a breadth of experience to pull from. And there's so many positives about it. I mean, I wouldn't want to be 20 again. I wouldn't mind having that body again, but I like... <laughs> you know, I'm being in the city just running around, but it's when I think of my mentality then, I, you know, I wish that I had what I have now in my brain. I feel like I would have done so much more, you know, but of course that's always how it is. Youth is wasted on the young. And yes, Val, you took the words out of my mouth. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and speaking of the young, you have two kids and I know you were late to the TikTok game, but you've been on social media for, for decades. Um, yeah. What how, now? As because I am one of these people, the you know one of those outliers. Me and my wife don't want to have children. We're too selfish. We're like we like the, the life we have. Uh, people used to make fun of us. They called us dinks, double income, no kids. Yes, uh, I, so amazing. It's it, it's it, trust me. It, it works for me and it works for my yeah. wife. Um, yeah. But as a, as a mom, now you have to worry about oh god, one of these days my kids gonna ask for a smartphone, and one of these days they're gonna want to be on social media. Have you, is it, I know it's kind of early, but uh, have you thought about that? Like what, how those conversations are going to play out? Yes. So my son is, he's eight and he wants to be in the business. He wants to be an actor. He wants, you know, a TikTok account. He wants it all, which against my better judgment, but um, he is my child. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you made him. So it's, you, uh, it's, it's expected. Yes. Yes. So, you know, we, we don't, let him do all this thing all those things you know like i i have a commercial agent and i've you know talked to them about like what it's like for kids in the business and things like that and i'm in the business so i i know i've worked with kids on sets and i don't feel that that's a great place for him to be right now so we're putting that you know off as long as possible but as far as social media i think what's really important is for him to see me on social media because he sees what I go through on TikTok where, you know, I'll make a video and be really excited about it and then it won't do well. And, 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 and I tell him about it. I'm like, yeah, I made this video. Like it didn't get a lot of, of views, but that doesn't matter because I liked it. I thought it was, he's like, mom, I thought it was hilarious. I'm like, yeah, me too. We have really good sets of humor. Um, so, you know, he sees that and I, I make sure to tell him like, it's not a failure. Like you just keep going, you know, or when I have one that does really well and he's like, Oh my God, mom, you're like famous. I'm like, first of all, definitely not. Please don't tell people that. And second of all, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. None of this matters. This is, you know, when, when he, he hears me say, oh, someone says something mean about me. And he's like, oh, aren't you upset? I'm like, yeah, of course that doesn't feel good, but these are not people that know me. So we don't care what they say. Like they don't know us. They don't know what kind of people we are. Um, so that's, you know, we call them a troll and we just don't respond. We just leave that alone. So, you know, I like for him to see all those things as I'm like delving into this world of content creation, um, that it's not about being perfect and it's not about having everyone like you because that's never going to happen and you're never going to always be perfect. You're never going to be perfect. But again, I think like you were saying, like that was my image of of um social media like the influencer and i'm like that's definitely not me uh, that perfection and that's why i stayed away from it for so long and i think for him to see that it's not about perfection it's actually the opposite it's about just kind of showing who you are as comfortable as with you know what you're comfortable with with giving and with showing people um but you're not giving it away it all belongs to you you know and you you have a say in in, in what you create and then you can't control other people, just like in life. You can't control what other people think about you, say about you, do. You know, most of the stuff in life we cannot control. Um, the only thing you can, can control is your brain and how you feel about yourself and how you think. And there'll be days where I'm like, I don't want to go on TikTok. I don't want to do any of this because I'm a human and I don't always feel like creating something. You know, like I just kind of feel like chilling and, and not thinking about it. Man, those are some really deep conversations with an eight-year-old. I think my conversation with my mom was like, don't eat your boogers. Like, <laughs> this is really, these are really deep conversations yeah. here. 
that and that is very much who he is. He's a, he's an old soul for sure. As much as I always hated when people said that oh, he's an old soul, he really is. I mean, he's like a really sensitive dude and has a is very inquisitive about everything in life. And um, I think it's unex. It, I didn't expect that this would be helpful in some way for him to see this, but I can see that it is. Um, you know, letting him know, like, you know, he has like a couple little videos on YouTube. He's like, no one's liking it. I'm not getting the, th the thumbs up. I'm like, dude, it's not about that. Like, you know, and, and then he sees that I truly am living that. Like, I'm like, you know, this video tanks, this video tanks, this one does great. This one tanks, like, it's fine. It, who cares? None of this matters. It really doesn't. Those are so, some great lessons. Those are amazing. I mean, it's so funny. It's such a, like, if you tried to win in a time machine, Jamie, and went back to your 20-year-old self and said, hey, I'm going to one day talk to my son about the fact that nobody cares what you think. And it's like, it's it's, it's such an unreal world we live in. But I think e even though it's such a hyper-focused thing you're talking about, whether it's, you know, reactions to social media and stuff like that, th these are lessons that will help him for the rest of his life for outside of social media. So I think in a way, again, social media, not so bad. It's actually helping you show your son that it's important to enjoy what you're doing and, and make that the barometer for why you would do something. Yeah, exactly. Really, it, again, like, because I was not a fan of social media, so it is very unexpected that these are the lessons, but this is, you know, what I'm getting from it right now is outweighs the negative. And I think that it can be that way for a lot of people. You know, I think like anything, it's you overindulge in it or this or that. And if I see myself doing that or I see myself getting too bogged down or upset about something someone said or, you know, whatever, then I stop. Like, it's fine. Like, it. I don't know. I, I can just keep saying, like, social media does not fucking matter. It really doesn't. Like, it's, you know, so I think just having that attitude and working on that, you know, it's not always easy because when you succeed at something, you want to keep it going, of course. But, you know, the older you get, you you do realize life is this and social media is this like. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So uh, let's end on a positive on on, on, a, on about your your TikTok account, because uh, you mentioned millions of views, hundreds of thousands of likes, 10,000 followers, nothing to sneeze at. You've only been doing this for less than a year. Um, what have been some of your favorite interactions with folks who've, who've reached out to you? You mentioned the troll, so let's let's go ahead and, yeah. and table that. Uh, what have been some of your great reactions you've had to people? Because obviously, if you're getting this sort of impact, people are liking what you're doing. So tell me about some of these interactions. Well, it's so cool for someone that you don't know to recognize that you're funny and to appreciate it and take the time to write a comment. I had someone say, get Lauren on the phone. This woman needs to be on SNL. I've had multiple comments like that. People were like, give this woman an Oscar. Who is her agent? You know, so that the ego is very happy with that. Like, I am funny. I am a great actor. Like, yeah. Um, you know, and, and besides that, even just meeting other parents other women my age other moms and seeing their content and helping to support them and um that has been bring that has brought me a lot of joy to see other people succeed and i think that that's something again as you get older you know how important that is to like keep clapping for people until it's your turn because it will be your turn and when it is it's no fun if no one is there to clap with you um and it just makes me feel good to make connections. You know, again, like we're on social media. We're, we're not, you know, in person or anything like that. But, you know, it is nice to to meet new people and, and see what they're creating and, and learn about them. Again, like the core of who I am, I'm interested in people and stories and, you know, social media does have that. You got to like dig through a lot of garbage to get to the good stuff. But I feel like I've met a lot of really cool, interesting people. Um, and that's fun. That's awesome. All right. Well, folks who want to be introduced to the journey of uh, Truth and Mommy, where should they start? What's, you know, social handles, websites? Uh, sh share that as we wrap things up. Yeah. Here. Um, so you can follow me on TikTok at Jamie Adursky. And you can I just started an Instagram page as well. That's um, at Truth and Mommy, Jamie Adursky. My website, jamieadursky.com. It's really just all Jamie Adursky. And apparently I'm the only one in the world with that last name. So 
Well, welcome to the club. I, I'm, it's, it's, it's actually great for Google. So yes. So when I, when everyone's looking up for me, there's not, not a lot of idiots oh. named Joe Partavilla. So same with Jamie Dursky. So right. that's, you're an idiot, but I'm just saying that there's no other <laughs> people like us Sometimes out there. Sometimes I am. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This was great. Thank you so much. And that's today's good listen. If you enjoyed our chat, please make sure to leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. It's a small gesture, but it really helps my channel. You can connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or on TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note and tell me your story, you can write to me at Joe Partavilla at ProtonMail.com. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate it. Until next time, adios.